I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zinner, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. More demolition in downtown Duluth brings temporary traffic reroutes and skywalk changes. In the long run, a new transit center under construction could result in some big gains for Duluth. The first ever Minnesota hiking celebration will be held in Duluth next week, featuring many high quality local trails and focusing on the state's trail building future. And we'll have the week's business headlines and a news file story from 25 years ago. It's all next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching the halfway point of August, Julie, and we've got some beautiful weather still to come. Yeah, it seems like it's hanging in there for a while, but it won't be long before the, the funeral dirge of summer will be upon <laughs> us. So. Don't go there. <laughs> All right, let's get started, Julie. All right. Thank you, Denny, and welcome, everyone. Demolition work is underway in downtown Duluth for a new multi-million dollar transit hub. After years of planning, the new multimodal facility will bring intercity and DTA buses together in one location. And it will provide a new face for Michigan Street, along with improved connectivity in downtown. Joining us with more on the project is Jim Heilig, Director of Administration and Planning at the DTA. So Jim, thanks for coming in tonight. Oh, thank you very uh, much for having us. Beautiful night. Folks who work downtown will be seeing some temporary changes, it sounds Definitely. like. Definitely. Uh, starting next Monday, actually, uh, one of the things, obviously, that we're doing is taking down the Wells Fargo ramp. Mm -hmm. And the ramp, if you recall, is right next to the Northwest Passage. And rather than risk having the passage uh, come down along with uh, the ramp, we're going to ask uh, citizens to forego using the Northwest Passage um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week, and basically from 7 in the morning till about 5.30 at night while we take down that corner mm -hmm. of, the, of the ramp. After that, then we will open up the Northwest Passage and it'll stay open yeah. all the way through uh, like June 20th sure. of uh, 2015. Jim, will any businesses have interruptions? Actually not. Uh, Michigan Street will remain open just as it is mm -hmm. now. And it, obviously it's limited, uh, you know, down to one lane around our, our facility and, and also there's other projects going down there that uh, have slowed down the street a bit. Now you mentioned that the Northwest Passage will be closed for a few days in the upcoming week. Um, do you have recommendations or, or kind of a plan B for folks who normally walk that route? And, and there are some options uh -huh. for them. The first basic thing is that we are going to run a DTA shuttle bus on those three days. Oh. Uh, so you can see on the map uh, we have actually two different routes. One uh, obviously is our summer trolley route that would be running anyway and that'll pick up people down in the deck area and bring them up uh, mm -hmm. into the downtown area or vice versa. That's free for mm -hmm. uh, folks doing that. And we also, especially during peak hours, will have additional DTA buses running uh, along that area and uh, we've been working with the deck mm -hmm. and surveyed like when people are sure. coming in and when pe people are leaving. So I mean we'll have as many as six buses an hour uh, moving between the yeah. deck area and the downtown area. And again, that's free for anyone that wants to ride those buses. Jim, can you give us a timetable for construction of the new transportation center? Oh sure. Uh, you know, this is kind of just our first phase here with right. the destruction, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and as we move through the rest of the summer, um, from early part of September, we'll actually start working on piling. Uh, and so that this is going to be a structure that is held up by piles and so uh, it'll be one of those where we're digging mm -hmm. holes in the ground and pounding the piles down to the bedrock. Uh, and early or late, late September into October is when we're going to start pouring concrete. We are going to work all winter long. Uh, so the concrete work will continue throughout the winter and by spring we, we are estimating we'll have the first uh, level down on the frontage road level done, the Michigan Street 
level will all be poured, and we'll have poured uh, what will become this uh, skywalk level mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, the multimodal transportation center has kind of morphed over time from early plans. Uh, uh, it's gone through a number of iterations. What does the current facility look like in, in your head? Because I understand that some of it's kind of still being designed even. Well, yeah, and it, it's a different process that we're uh -huh. actually using. You know, historically, most public en entities will design something and then throw it out for bid. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, and, you know, it's with a complete design. Uh, we're doing what's called a design build project. And so we hired essentially or through a bid process, of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> we hired a contractor and an architectural firm to work together. Uh, to design and build this and we're working along with them. So as an example, right now we're working on, on some of the interior type stuff. It's not designed yet. Uh, it'll go out for bid here in the next two weeks mm -hmm. and, and some of that work won't start until the spring of 2015. Mm -hmm. What it exactly looks like, we're not 100%. Obviously the drawings that you're seeing on the screen are what we believe uh, the exteriors were lo would look yeah. like, because we're past that a little bit. Mm -hmm. so we used to call them bus depots years ago. Or bus barns. <laughs> or and bus barns. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about the services that will be provided at the transportation oh, center? It's not it, just a bus it, coming it, and going. It's a definite step up. You know, part, part of it is, is in Duluth here especially, we've just got a heck of a lot of loyal customers. And we're moving down to Michigan Street, which for some people is a little off the beaten path. But it, So we really wanted to make an atmosphere that was just be warm and welcoming for those folks. And offer additional services. So obviously the services that we had going on in the existing Transit Center East in terms of DTA staff mm -hmm. and, and tons of electronic information will be there. The police are moving uh, down into the new facility so they'll actually have a major substation down there instead of uh, four or five officers there'll be 15 officers working there. Working out of there. Yeah, Jefferson Lines uh, will will move into there. Uh, the, undecided if they're going to keep their West Duluth, they'll still be obviously stopping up at the university. Uh, and Arrowhead Transit, which serves all over uh, this Arrowhead area, will also be coming in. So we'll have those types of things. We're prepared if the North Star train <laughs> comes to us, Analex, uh, to work with them also. So we've got uh, some contingency plans built in for that. Uh, we're doing uh, some new things just in even in terms of parking. We'll have uh, eight charging stations for electric cars and, and we'll actually be hooked up so we can in increase that to as many as 32. Uh, we'll have programs for var van pools and car pools. We're going to have the first secure bike storage area in downtown Duluth. As Sounds well like as you're, typical re us. you're really planning for the long-term future. Well, you know, we don't build these every day. <laughs> you know, the current transit centers were built back in 84. Uh, in, in that time frame. We're hoping that this one lasts longer than that. Mm -hmm. what, why is it so important in your mind to really have this hub of transportation in downtown Duluth? Well, it just makes it so much easier for mm -hmm. our, our passengers, mm -hmm. uh, bottom line. You know, and, and think of our typical winter, not last winter, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but we have just a whole slew of people that have all sorts of different issues uh, with winter travel, whether sure. that, whether there's somebody in a wheelchair or whatever. We're getting those people out of the weather. We're bringing them into a warm area. We're bringing the buses up there. We're making sure that all the transfers can get made. We do tons of what we call through routing, so people like that live in West Duluth and are going up to the hospitals can stay on the same bus mm -hmm. all the way through downtown uh, or up to the university, and that works wonderful. But there's still a group of people that need to transfer, and this is a place that makes it easy for them. Mm -hmm. They'll be w it'll be warm, warm it'll be there. welcoming. Uh, all those types of friendly things. It'll be a real nice amenity. So the, the buses will actually be coming inside the building some for, for will, people to load, or will there be some Some of them will be outdoor? inside the building, and some of them will be on Michigan Street at the approximate location where the sidewalk is on the lower side right now. Uh -huh. But there'll be a uh, covered canopy uh, mm -hmm. over, over the buses. Uh, and, and all those types of things. We'll have our information signs there, so people will be able to see inside that the bus is coming in two minutes, one minute, oh, really? whatever, uh, so they can stay warm <laughs> until that last 10 seconds. <laughs> They'll know exactly where that bus is going to park, uh -huh. so they can be all ready for it. Did well, the DTA take a traffic survey, and if so, what did you learn? Oh, we took several traffic studies, uh, and, and, and again, a lot of the work that we're doing 
or the multimodal, we have a lot of street work that's tied to that. So 2nd Avenue West and 3rd Avenue West right now between Michigan and, and Spear Street obviously is one way in each direction. As we move through and open up the multimodal, they're going to become two-way streets between Michigan oh. and Superior Street. And up on uh, Superior Street then the DTA is uh, the one that's uh, got the stop signs up right now because <laughs> we're uh, putting in new signalization uh, there that not only will allow for the two-way traffic there but also has some uh, bus priority uh, software incorporated into them so it'll know when the buses are coming mm -hmm. and help us move through downtown. It has emergency stuff hooked in there so the fire or, or police if they choose can can jet right through those intersections. Mm -hmm. At the same time we're adding a new signal down at 3rd Avenue West uh, in Michigan Street and uh, all this is designed to make our traffic move better and make the downtown traffic move better. Mm -hmm. Now uh, at the Holiday Inn where uh, or the Holiday Center where a lot of the buses have been transferring um, in the past there have been some issues with loitering with panhandling um, you mentioned that the police are going to have a, a, an office, a pretty strong right. presence down in the new transit center. Do you think that will um, alleviate some of those issues, or, or what are you doing for security? You know, down? inside the, the facility, we have probably less problems in the, than there have historically been on the street. Uh, you know, in some of these folks that are causing some of these issues have nothing to do with the buses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They may still be up on Superior Street. We think there'll be less of less of that, but down in our area. You know, I, I think we're, we're starting with the, the, two, the carrot and stick types of things where <laughs> we're going to be warm and welcoming and respectful uh, sure. to anyone that's down there. And at the, at the same time, we'll just have our policies set, uh, you know, that if something is going wrong, it's something that we're going to address. What will be the operations uh, operating hours, the center's operating wow. hours, and how many people do you expect to maybe serve in a day? You know, right now at the two transit centers, we serve about 5,000 people a day in terms of DTA passengers. There's probably another 2,000 people that are uh, entering Transit Center East just for skywalk access at, at this point in time. We anticipate that we'll be in that neighborhood of you know seven to 10,000 people uh, interacting with the new multimodal. And again, it's tied to the existing Transit Center on the lower side of the street too. Uh, people will be able to walk right off of Superior Street, right through where the police are right now. There will be a new Skywalk Bridge going across Michigan Street and into the new facility. So it's going to be just super easy for folks to access uh, the, the bus transit as well as the deck. Our hours in the morning, obviously, w we have buses on the street as early as 4 a.m the transit uh, facility will be open then. Our last buses leave downtown after 1 a.m. It'll be open till then. It'll be open till then. So much more, and, and, and the skywalks that we're talking about in that area are going to operate on DTA time. Uh, we set those up as actually DTA skywalks rather than typical public skywalks so that we could control those times w to follow what our buses are doing. Expecting to open when? Around Thanksgiving uh, or a little thereafter of 2015. Okay. It'll be a lot of work between now and then. <laughs> I hope so. Exciting to follow, <laughs> and might encourage a, a few more people to to consider taking the buses. No That's question uh, about yeah. it. Yeah. And and the interface with the bikes, I think, is huge. Sure. All right. Well, thank you. Jamie. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate yep. you coming. Thank you. Good, Good luck discussion. with the project. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. The state of Minnesota began a lakeshore cabin site leasing program in the early 1900s. Its purpose was to enhance the development of northern Minnesota shorelines. We had so much land in northern Minnesota, it was a way of encouraging economic development of areas that at that time were uh, rather uh, undeveloped. In 1973, a state law was passed prohibiting any new leases from being issued. Then last year, a special act of the legislature made these lakeshore sites available for sale, a task undertaken by the state DNR. The department was mandated uh, actually about four years ago to start selling the lease lots that we had been managing as a department for the school trust fund. Uh, so we're simply following through on a legislative mandate to uh, sell these lots in an orderly fashion at public auction. The sale of these sites is controversial. 
Families that have leased for generations are now confronted with losing the land to outside investors. But the state law requires the land to go up for auction and to the highest bidder. In 1998, we will have, uh, by legislative mandate, sold the last of the uh, s approximately 1,700 lease lots that the state has scattered through 11 northern counties. In Eveleth, Kevin DiLorenzo, KDLH News. Of the seemingly endless number of outdoor options in our region, hiking is one of the most popular. Next weekend, hiking enthusiasts from far and wide will converge on Duluth Spirit Mountain for the Minnesota Hiking Celebration. It's the culmination of two plus years of planning and the first time an event like this has been held in Minnesota. Now here to talk about the event and more is Derek Passy, an avid hi hiker and an experienced trail builder. Uh, welcome, Derek. Thank you very much for being here. Tell us about this hiking celebration. What's it all about? Hiking celebration is a way to get people together on from the North Country Trail. Uh, North Country Trail is uh, 4,600 miles of hiking trail that connects seven states uh, from Lake Champlain over in New York all the way to Lake Sakakawi in North Dakota. Is all of that trail accessible? It's the, it's a hiking trail. So there are parts that are accessible, handicap accessible. Uh, some of the trail is still a road walk and mm -hmm. we're working to fill in the pieces as we go. Mm -hmm. Now you're a, what we described I think as an avid hiker. What is it about hiking that really appeals to you? I, I am very, I really like to work in the wilderness areas, the wilderness hiking trails. Uh, my shirt is the Keck Trail, which mm -hmm. is in the BWCA. Mm -hmm. I keep asking them to put the hiking in there rather than just canoeing. Uh, <laughs> and hiking gets you more of an intimate experience with the woods than in a canoe. You're right next to the trees touching them and the Boundary Waters canoe area is, has some great mm -hmm. hiking trails in the, in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So when you think of a hiking trail, it's, more, it's different from a walking trail that people might be familiar with yes. around here. It is an unpaved trail. Uh -huh. uh, gravel base, a lot of times rocky, rooty, you know, trip a few times, uh, <laughs> watch where you're walking. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the kind of trail I really enjoy. Uh, and the trail, the best trail, isn't marked with flags every 20 feet or so. And especially in the wilderness where we can't. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's our job to make sure the trail is obvious mm -hmm. to someone who's coming behind you so they don't get lost, uh, as well as uh, taking people into the wilderness, we show them where the trail is. We give them, educate them what the trail yeah. looks like and what to look for. Uh, Driving around town, any town, you might not see the trail. So can you tell us a little bit of how busy are these trails? Uh, the Spirit Hiking Trail runs through the city of Duluth. It starts down at uh, Spirit Mountain where this event is centered mm -hmm. and it goes all the way up through, uh, well, it goes on Canal Park, so you definitely see it on the boardwalk. And this is one of the few areas where uh, we looked at it and it's an obvious attraction that people want to see Canal Park and experience that. But most of the trail goes up the, uh, through the parks and goes up by Hawk Ridge and through uh, the city's parks and exits the city and you really never know about it, uh, but you often see people's cars parked there. I, just last week I yeah. drove up 61. I saw about a dozen cars parked at one of the trailheads. Now you live in Two Harbors. Could you walk from here all the way home? Uh, on no. The trail? Ironically, okay. the trail doesn't go through Two Harbors. Oh. It, the Spear Hiking Trail headquarters is in Two Harbors. However, to cross the railroad tracks, there's only about one or two places that we're allowed to cross. And it happens to be one of the areas where, where we share the crossing with the snowmobile trail. Uh, most of the trail is, well, all the trail is non-motorized. Are there a lot of stretches of trail in this area that are underutilized or could use some attention? Uh, the wilderness trails tend to be underutilized. Uh -huh. The Powell Trail, for instance, um, still has, I looked it up last night, they have 999 entry permits available. Mm. This is a BWCA entry. Uh, but what happened is it wasn't an entry point when they established the permits and they have never felt a need to restrict the number of people sure. 
getting permits because people just don't use the trails as Derek, much. Derek, who, who maintains the trails? The trails in the Boundary Waters are primarily maintained by volunteers. Oh. Uh, it, the Border Route Trail, which connects the Keck Trail to the Spear Hike Trail, is also main, maintained by volunteers. Uh, Minnesota Rovers out of the Twin Cities, the University of Minnesota Outdoor Club. They would take a section? For a number of years. Yes, and that's, that's uh, I think it's about 60 miles that they maintain. Mm -hmm. In the Spear Hiking Trail is also maintained by volunteers. However, they do have a couple of paid coordinators to yeah. work with volunteers. Because the trail system is so vast, are there camping facilities or can you go off into the woods and camp if you chose? It varies. Uh, a lot of the, the Spear Hiking Trail goes through state parks and you're, they connect up to the campgrounds in sure. state parks. There's also established campsites along the trails that people can camp. But there's also places that the trail goes across private property. Mm -hmm. So people are asked to respect, respect the private that. property and stay on the trail and not camp in those areas. Mm -hmm. Now I understand there's some legislation that's been introduced to reroute part of the, the North Country National Scenic Trail. Talk about that a bit. The North Country Trail, when it was first established, uh, went from two harbor, uh, not, pardon me, it went from uh, J. Cook State Park mm -hmm. And it went straight across roughly on the uh, Highway 2 corridor to Grand Rapids. At that time, the uh, Superior Hiking Trail did not exist. The border route did not exist. And the Keck Trail was a fire trail that hadn't been maintained for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So none of these trails were in existence at that time. Uh, since then, these were all established or reopened. And it's a fantastic hiking experience, mm -hmm. right? right along the border of Canada, uh, the first ridge back from Lake Superior, and then through the heart of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And so what we've been trying to do is to work with the National Park Service, who is, administers the trail, to redesignate the trail mm -hmm. for the, the quote-unquote arrowhead reroute. So it goes up and around the arrowhead rather than through the swamps sure. that are along Highway 2, which would be a lot of boardwalk. Certainly a good number of our viewers live in Wisconsin. To your knowledge, are there some good hiking trails in Wisconsin? Absolutely. That's one of my, my adopted trail on the North Country Trail that I maintain is in the Rainbow Lakes Wilderness. Once again, a wilderness trail, but I guess I'm spoiled a little bit. <laughs> uh, and the Squamagon National Forest has about 45 miles of trails through it. Uh, and then there's Copper, uh, Copper Falls State Park mm. on the East end of uh, J. Cook, or east end of Wisconsin, and the trail is main, built all the way over to uh, J. Cook on, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Some beautiful areas. Let's talk about the event that's coming up sure. next week. Uh, what what do you expect in terms of uh, you know the folks who who come in and what they'll experience? Well, what I expect and what I hope for is our couple different things. Uh, I expect that there will be a lot of people from North Country Trail that come from many different states from far away. Uh, this is takes place in lieu of a, an annual conference, which has been occurred annually. And so it's not being held this year, but hopefully people come to this celebration. Uh, but we're also trying to encourage people in Duluth to attend. We're inviting uh, We've actually got the Geocache Association coming to have a geocache uh, hike and trying to get families to come, trying to get yeah. other groups like Mountain Bike Association. Which prompts the question, who then is a typical hiker who may want to <laughs> attend this event? Anybody who wants to get out on the trails, find out where they are, and is physically able to, to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a wide range of hikes that we've planned. Uh, they are in Duluth, and we're working at shuttles, so you don't have to walk back on a road. or. There's no certain you know. pace. You take your time. And we will have a, a hiking lead for all the hikes, and we will have someone designated to be sweep, uh, to follow, be the slowest of the hikers, to make sure everybody can uh, make it to the trailhead or mm -hmm. otherwise, or make it to the end or otherwise find other arrangements for them. So. Is there any cost associated with this, or can people just show up? <laughs> one, of the, one of the planners of this said he wanted to make this a no-cost event. Oh. And so there is no cost 
unless you go to the banquet on Thursday evening. The banquet on Thursday evening also has uh, Representative Nolan going to be there. So it's mm -hmm. uh, who has recently introduced inf uh, legislation to for the Arrowhead reroute. That's and right. are there still tickets available for that? Or? Yes, sir. Right. And how do people get them if they want to go? They can go to the uh, website for the North Country Trail and go to the Minnesota Hike Cel Celebration or okay. the Facebook page. Derek Passy, thank you so very much. All the best. Thank you. Keep hiking. I will. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's time for the week's business headlines from Business North. Jim Carlson, the Duluth business owner who was convicted of selling illegal synthetic drugs in his downtown store, received a 17-year prison sentence Thursday from a U.S. federal district court judge. His incarceration comes in addition to the previous confiscation of his personal cash, his last place on earth building, and personal residences. Carlson had faced more than 50 criminal counts for selling mind-altering substances that in previous years had skirted controlled substance laws. His Superior Street store was widely scorned by other merchants because it attracted lines of intoxicated people whose behavior scared away their customers. A new tour entitled Nooks and Crannies was launched this week at Glensheen Mansion in Duluth. It features never before seen rooms that had previously been locked and restricted to the public. Now on display is the second floor of the carriage house, which contains multiple horse-drawn buggies, as well as a hand-operated freight elevator. Also joining the display areas is the boathouse, which is the only one remaining on Lake Superior. Also now open is Clara Congdon's balcony, which overlooks Tisher Creek, and the boiler room, a coal-powered heating plant that was used in past years. Damon John, the millionaire business mogul and star of ABC's Shark Tank reality show, will be the keynote speaker during a Tuesday seminar at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. The event is structured as a learning event for aspiring entrepreneurs and established professionals. John learned to sew from his mother and started making the tie top hat, which he originally sold on the streets of Queens, New York. His brand grew to eventually record annual sales of $350 million. For more business and economic news, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment about our show, now's the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send your comments in an email to almanacnorthwdse.org. And you can visit the WDSC website for the latest program information, news about the station, and to see previews and clips of your favorite PBS shows. Well, it's a busy construction season all across the Northland. Good to see a lot of growth now in the downtown Duluth area this summer. There is a lot going on. Lots of good stuff. Demolition before construction. <laughs> but it's coming, huh? Okay. It is indeed. All right, for Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night and be kind.